Well, good morning. good morning. Welcome to House of the Lord this morning. Good to have you here. Glad to be here. Man, we're expecting God to do awesome things this morning. And so uh, we just want to say a word of welcome to you. And what a blessing it is to be able to be with you this morning, be in the house of the Lord to encourage one another and to worship him. He is worthy of our praise. Amen. Amen. We also have the opportunity to recognize some graduates this morning. And so we're going to do that after our offertory today. Um, but before we jump into some singing ourselves, uh, let me direct your attention to your bulletin. Um, we have a lot of information, a lot of things going on this summer that we want to go ahead and, and put on your radar. Hello. Uh, the first being this insert. Uh, it is two pages. Be sure you look at both pages. But um, they've put together sort of the scope of all that we're going to be doing for our CLC uh, remodel and so we are excited about this we want you to look over this we're still waiting on a few minor details to come in so that we can get this approved internally and then our plan is to present this uh, remodel to you for a vote next Sunday after our um, morning service and so uh, we wanted you to have this so that you could already be looking it over and have a better idea of the exact things that we're talking about a lot of good stuff that's going to be happening, and we're so excited. We want you to be excited about it as well, and, um, and we want you to be informed so that you'll be ready to vote next Sunday. Um, if you'll direct your attention to our trifold bulletin, we've already mentioned to you about our Vacation Bible School that's coming up. There's a place there where you can scan a, a QR code to register, um, but we also wanted to let you know about our missions camps. Uh, that are there. Parents, if you'll go ahead and get with Taylor or myself to sign your uh, child up for our missions camp so that we can get registration going for that, we would appreciate it. We also want to let you know about some ministry opportunities that we have. Um, on June the 16th, uh, we are going to be feeding the staff over at Camp Caraway, and so we need your help. We need your help preparing food, and we need your help serving that food. I understand that's Father's Day. Uh, let me explain why we're doing it on Father's Day. Father's Day is the Sunday before um, probably their biggest week of camp for the summer. It is the week when they will have the guys and the girls uh, at the camp for Warrior Camp and Horizons Camp. And it's a big week for the staff. And so it's a privilege for us to be able to go before that camp begins and to encourage the staff and uh, to minister to them. And so uh, understand it's a busy day, but uh, do ask that you pray about helping us with that. It's a great opportunity for us to love on them and to start their week of ministry off strong. Uh, we'll also have a time of worship with them after dinner if you would like to stick around uh, at camp for that. Another thing we wanted to let you know about, uh, this month we have a fifth Sunday, um, but due to possible CLC renovations, but also an opportunity that we have as a community to worship together, uh, we want to let you know about something called Church at Ashboro. There's an announcement in your bulletin about this, but uh, we are inviting churches all around Randolph County, uh, evangelical churches, to gather over at the Ashboro uh, football stadium for worship together as the body of Christ. And we're going to focus on the gospel. We're not going to focus on our denominational differences, but we're going to focus on Jesus. We're going to focus on the gospel. And so Crossroad Baptist Church, the deacons and myself, uh, really feel like this is something that we want to be a part of, and we're going to participate this year. And so we wanted you to know ahead of time to be planning to join us. We won't be meeting here for, for our small group time or for worship that day. We will be having worship at the football field, and that will be begin at 9 a.m., and it will go until 1130. And you can come and go as, as you feel comfortable, whatever you feel is best for you. There will be uh, some, you can bring some pop-ups that they'll put along the side of the stands. If you um, are concerned about sun and you want some shade, uh, there's, there's some, some, some things that they're making accommodations for. Um, there is going to be a place where people can go for prayer, and there's also going to be a place for people to uh, come forward for baptism. And so we're praying that the Lord would use that. I'm telling you, I've experienced that. I've seen it. God is doing the work among Randolph County churches to bring us together to represent Christ as the body of Christ. And uh, this is just another way that we see God doing that. And so we hope that you'll plan to join us um, that Sunday. Um, Serve NC is coming up in August, and this is an opportunity for all North Carolina Baptist churches to be missional in their communities. And so this will be the week of August the 3rd through the 10th. 
And so we wanted to go ahead and put that on your calendar so that you'll be planning to help us as we put together some things that we're going to be doing as Crossroad Baptist Church, but also just so that you would be in prayer about what God might be leading us to do uh, that week as we focus on our local missions and we think about ways that we can be active in our community. Um, we are going to be recognizing our graduates uh, after our offertory today, and so we look forward to doing that and honoring their accomplishments um, but, but man, now we want to turn our hearts to the Lord in, in worship and in singing, for he is worthy of our praise. Amen? Amen? So would you pray with me as we get started? Father God, thank you again for the privilege to be in your house today. Lord, to sing songs of praise to you, to see you high and lifted up. And we thank you, Father, for the opportunity to encourage brothers and sisters in Christ. And uh, Lord, as I bring a word for your people, your word for your people. Lord, would you just keep me humble, Lord, and, and that it would be your message, not my message. Lord God, that you would speak and that we would hear and that we would apply your, your words to our hearts and to our lives and that we would walk in obedience to them. Lord, may you fill this place with your spirit and may you use this time for your will as you see fit. And we look forward in, in anticipation for how you're going to move, not just in this moment but through us this week and so we pray this all in jesus name amen amen good morning everybody let's all stand and worship king jesus what a privilege we have to be in the house of the lord today come all you weary come all you thirsty come to the well that never runs dry drink of the water from and thirst no more come all you sinners come find his mercy come to the table he will satisfy taste of his goodness find what you're looking for So love the world that he gave us, his one and only son to save us. Whoever believes in him will live forever. Bring all your failures, bring your addictions, come lay them down at the foot of the cross. Jesus is waiting. Open arms For God so loved The world that he gave us His one and only Son to save us Whoever believes in him Will live forever The power of hell Forever defeated Now it is well I'm walking in freedom for God so long. God so loved the world. Praise God, praise God, from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, praise Him, for the wonders of His love. Oh, 
addictions come lay them down at the foot of the cross jesus is waiting god so loved the world amen let's give him a hand clap of praise father we're so thankful this morning Christ is my firm foundation, the rock on which I stand when everything around me is shaken. I've never been more glad that I put my faith in Jesus, cause he's never
Hey, that's what heaven's gonna be like. I hope you guys are getting prepared now, right now here on earth, because that's what we're gonna be doing around the throne with the saints and the angels, right? I'm getting fired up, so I'm gonna go sit down now. All right, I'm about to go into it again. <laughs> I'm getting fired up. I'm gonna go ahead and sit down now. All right, Pastor Justin, it's your turn. So what a privilege it is that we have to repeat the video. <laughs> to, to recognize the move of God in the lives of our young people and to, to recognize uh, this chapter in their lives and to celebrate along with them their accomplishments. And so we get to do that today. And, and I, I love Graduation Sunday, not just because it gives me an opportunity to wear my Liberty shirt, um, but, but because, man, this is a special day. And let me just say, you don't have to point out that it's fitting a little tighter than it has before. I'm not sensitive about it at all, so just leave me alone on that. I'm working on it. But uh, I'm going to ask Alex and Brianna to come up to uh, the stage and join me up here as we recognize them. Just come on. You're good, just like you are. Praise God. And uh, uh, you've got several uh, graduates in your, um, in your program here. We had some sickness today, and so be praying for those that weren't able to be here today. Uh, but we want to recognize these young ladies, and we're so proud of them. Um, Alex, uh, Alexandria Britton Toller uh, is, is, is our first graduate, and you've got your, her accomplishments there that you can see. Um, but what a, what, a, what a fantastic young lady you are. It has been my privilege uh, to see what God has done in you. Um, I wanted to point out to you that there is, a, is an accomplishment that is not listed in your program, and that is that she was recognized as Batman <laughs> most recently by her uh, chorus teacher. And uh, I'll let you ask her about that award so that she can share that with you. But uh, I got the privilege to see that be awarded to her, and, uh, and I was very proud to say that you were one of my students. But she will be going to UNC Charlotte and double majoring in theater and exercise science. And so, young lady, we are proud of you, and we thank God for you. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. You stay right there. Both of these young ladies are graduating from Uwari Charter Academy, and we have the privilege of hosting Uwari Charter's baccalaureate service this evening. And so, hopefully, we'll see you ladies both there tonight. Um, but this is Brianna Lynn Rhodes. And um, the first thing that you need to know about her so that you can be in prayer for her is that she comes to us as Stephen Heiler's girlfriend. <laughs> so, you know, you might question her, um, you know. <laughs> but we do, we do pray for her. And, and, I'll, and I'll just put it to you this way. I, I will take our young people as, as part of our church any way that I can take them. And if, if they end up coming by way of knuckleheads like my buddy Stephen. <laughs> See, now, if you'd have just given me high fives for all these years, I would be so much easier on you and so much more loving to you. But you get what you get. <laughs> but, um, but Brianna is, uh, as, like I mentioned, also graduating from URI Charter. And she's planning to attend UNC Charlotte as well and majoring in dance and wants to become a dance teacher. And so, young lady, we thank God for you. 
and we are in prayer for you and so proud of you both. Let's give it a, a round of applause for our graduates. And so take the, take the opportunity today to congratulate these ladies and let them know uh, that you'll be praying for them and what God has in store for them uh, moving forward. And we're thankful for the opportunity to, to celebrate with you and to honor you for your accomplishments. And so what a privilege. Well, uh, if you've got your Bibles, and I hope that you do, turn to Acts chapter 15. As I thought about graduation Sunday, I began to, to look at Acts and see if I thought that it would be a, a relevant word for us and for our graduates today. And I, I feel it is. Um, graduation is this entering into something new. It is this process of something different, not quite adulthood, but certainly not childhood. And it means being in positions to make your own decisions. And some young people are better prepared for that than others. But nevertheless, it is a reality of growing and developing and moving into uh, new chapters of our lives with the Lord. And so as we think about what it means to be a college student, what it means to be a graduate, what it means to enter into new chapters in life, it can also mean that we find ourselves in new places with new people and, um, and God-given influence with different and new people. I can remember as a college student interacting with people who had very different backgrounds than myself and different worldviews even. And so we run into people as we enter adulthood who believe differently than we do. And so as I thought about that, I, I just thought, you know, it's important that we not only know what we believe, but we know why, and we know where to go when we run into questions that we don't have answers for. And so I feel like Acts 15 helps us with those three things, knowing what we believe, knowing why we believe it, and knowing how and where to go to get the answers to the questions that we don't have answers to. And so if you think about Acts chapter 15, if you think about the, the journey that we've been on in the book of Acts, we get a picture of here what it looks like when we deal with spiritual disagreements. And so I've entitled this message today, Dealing with Spiritual Disagreements. Because what we've seen is that we've seen the dynamic of the early church, that the church is developing and they are shifting. And there is a very new thing that God is doing among his people in the work of salvation and redemption. And so with this dynamic, we begin to see growing pains. And that's certainly true here in chapter 15. There arises a theological difference among the believers. And I want to make sure that I point out that, that fine point there, that this is a spiritual disagreement among the believers. And so when you think about what God is doing among the church and how the church is growing... The gospel is being preached. People are converting to the way and they're practicing their faith in a new and different context. But the new and the different context gives occasion for the old ways to come into conflict with the new. And so that's what we see happening here in Acts chapter 15. And so we're going to jump in uh, looking first at verses 1 through 5. So if you'll join me there uh, before we read, let's go before the Lord and let's ask him to speak to us this morning. God, we, we do come before you with open Bibles and open hearts to your word, and we ask, God, that you would reveal the truth of your word to us today, Lord, that you would speak through me as, a, as just a mouthpiece, as a humble servant, Lord, that my words would fall short and that your words would be heard uh, by your people, among your people, and that your people would respond, God. And so move in this time, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, Pick up there in verse 1 with me, for it says that some men came down from Judea, and they were teaching the brothers that unless you are circumcised according to the custom of Moses, you cannot be saved. And after Paul and Barnabas had no small dissension and debate with them, Paul and Barnabas and some of the others were appointed to go up to Jerusalem to the apostles and to the elders about this question. And so being sent on their way by the church, they passed through both Phoenicia and Samaria, describing in detail the conversion of the Gentiles and brought great joy to all the brothers. But when they came to Jerusalem, they were welcomed by the church and the apostles and the elders. They declared all that God had done with them. 
But, verse 5, some believers who belonged to the party of the Pharisees rose up and said, It is necessary to circumcise them and to order them to keep the law of Moses. Consider the context of these verses. The gospel, again, has now been fully extended to the Gentiles. We saw that with Peter. We see it with Paul going and sharing the gospel and people responding. We see that in the persecution, in the opposition that rises to this gospel going out. And what we recognize is that it was always God's plan to do this, but it was new to God's people. And more importantly, it was not popular among some of God's people. And so there was a revolutionary context of their religious culture. Their religion and their beliefs were very woven into the nature of their culture, how they lived their lives. And so, so new developments, spiritually, would raise new spiritual questions. And so what we see is that Jewish believers, those who were Jews and now they're looking to Christ as a fulfillment of the law and the prophets and they're believing in the death, the burial, the resurrection of Jesus as Messiah, they were believers. But they sought to assimilate these Gentile believers into their religious practices. In other words, these believers who were Jews wanted the Gentiles to become Jews so that they could be saved. And it's this classic scenario, this classic question of law versus grace. And so that's point number one for us this morning. That we see in these verses this dichotomy between law and grace. And both of these things exist and how do they exist together? How are we to think about the dynamic of law and grace? And so this law, this grace... um, is, is a classic scenario, but it's not an easily answered question. There was much difficulty in regards to how they would think through this new thing that they are seeing God do. And so the debate on circumcision pointed to this larger question of, of Jewish law in view of Christian faith. After all, the Mosaic law was God's law. It had come from God. It was what God had given them. In fact, circumcision goes all the way back to Abraham. And they were commanded to be circumcised. Though in those days we were told that it was by faith that Abraham was credited with righteousness. Abraham's salvation came by grace through faith. But nevertheless, there was an obedience that God expected and commanded of the people. And so culturally and religiously, Uh, The Jews and the Gentiles were very different. And I think part of our struggle to understand the the realities of what's happening here is because we are far removed culturally and in our time from the days in which we find ourselves in this passage. It makes it less obvious just how complicated this disagreement was among them. And I want you to notice uh, in verse 2 and beyond as we see this dissension stirring up. I wanted you to notice the volumes that we see spoken to the transformation that's happened in the life of Paul. Paul, this staunchly Jewish person who had become now a follower of Christ. He and Barnabas now stand firmly in opposition to this Judaization, this, 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 this Jewishness of the gospel. That Paul stands in opposition to somehow making Gentile believers Jews before they could be believers. Paul opposes this notion. And, and Paul preaches a gospel, a salvation, how? By grace through faith. Not by works so that any man would boast. But the question remains, where does this leave the law? Again, God's commanded obedience to the law, as well as commanded our faith. And so what we see in in our text today, I I submit to you, is a story of how the church handled these differences. I want to point out to you the process that they entered into to resolve this debate. 
And before we get into verses 6 and following, I wanted to note to you uh, Luke's emphasis. Because if you look at verses 3 and 4, Luke does not focus on the spiritual disagreement here. Rather, Luke's focus is on the work of God among the Gentiles. And I want you to see the difference. That Luke points out Paul and Barnabas going and, and not making much of this debate, but making much of the salvation that has come to the Gentile. It's not until we get to verse 5 that we see this group of, again, believers, those who had put faith in Christ, re resorting back to their pharisaical ways. And, and what we note here is that they resist the temptation to see the work of God. They, they almost overlook God's glorious work of salvation among the Gentiles, and they appeal to their, their um, tradition, to their practices. And so we ought to take note here to resist the temptation to let theological differences distract us from the work of God among us. There's a powerful word that we ought to heed as well. But that being said, the dissension among the people was worthy of their careful consideration. And, and they needed to arrive at a consensus. And so let's look and see how they, they went about that process. Look with me. At verse 6, and we're going to read verses 6 through 21 here. It says, the, the apostles and the elders gathered together to consider this matter. And after there had been much debate, Peter stood up and he said to them, Brothers, you know that in the early days God made a choice among you, that by my mouth the Gentiles should hear the word of the gospel and believe. And God, who knows the heart, bore witness to them by giving them the Holy Spirit just as he did to us. And he made no distinction between us and them, having cleansed their hearts by faith. Now, therefore, why are you putting God to test by placing a yoke on the neck of the disciples that neither our fathers nor we have been able to bear? But we believe that we will be saved through the grace of the Lord Jesus, just as they will. And all the assembly fell silent. They listened to Barnabas and Paul as they related what signs and wonders God had done through them among the Gentiles. And after they finished speaking, James replied, Brothers, listen to me. Simeon has related how God first visited the Gentiles to take from them a people for his name. And with this, the words of the prophets agree, just as it is written. Verse 16, after this, I will return and I will rebuild the tent of David that has fallen. I will rebuild its ruins and I will restore it. That the remnant of mankind may seek the Lord and all the Gentiles who are called by my name, says the Lord who makes these things known from of old. Therefore, my judgment is that we should not trouble those of the Gentiles who turn to God. But we should write to them. To abstain from the things polluted by idols, from sexual immorality, and from what has been strangled, and from blood. For from ancient generations, Moses has had in every city those who proclaim him, for he is read every Sabbath in the synagogues. And so we see how they approached this disagreement. And, and I was... Drawn to the words of James. James, at the end of it all, said this. We should not trouble those of the Gentiles who turn to God. And that's point number two. Turn to God. Why? Why is this point number two? Well, turn to God. This phrase is not only the context for who they had become, those who had turned to God, but it also defines their approach for resolving this matter. When they faced spiritual disagreements, they turned to God. And I want to show you four ways that they turned to God. Because what they're doing is they're appealing to a sovereign God for discernment. And I think there are four ways, four distinct ways in these verses, 6 through 21, that we see them appealing to God, turning to God for, for help in this matter. And so this would be kind of sub points if you're taking notes. Ways that they turned to God. The first way was that they appealed to God's nature. So they're looking to God and they say, well, what does the nature of God tell us 
about how we ought to think about this issue. And you say, well, where am I getting that? Well, if you look at verses 6 through 11, what we see is Peter speaking and appealing to the historic way that God has dealt with the people. Peter looked back on God's working through him for the sake of the Gentiles to hear the gospel and believe. In other words, the nature of God was an inclusive nature. That it was God who was making a way for the Gentiles and he was using the Jews to do it. He was using these men. God, knowing their heart, confirmed their faith, confirmed their salvation, and their part with Christ. How did he do it? Peter points out that they have this representation of the same Holy Spirit and that the representation was the same representation. That what they saw the Spirit of God doing in them, they saw the Spirit of God doing in these Gentile believers. And so it was God's nature that made no distinction here between the two. Instead, his nature was to cleanse their hearts by faith. That his nature was to do this in the same way that he had done it for Abraham and had been doing it since Abraham. He cleansed their hearts by faith. Peter argues that the law hasn't provided anyone righteousness. But as Paul would teach, that the law exists to condemn. The law exists to reveal our shortcomings. The law exists to reveal to us that we don't measure up to God's standard. And so no one, Peter says, can keep this yoke, can bear this yoke that the law has put upon us. And so what, how does he respond? He, he appeals rather to God's nature. To see salvation had come by grace through faith for all who believe. Yes, the Jew, but also the Gentile. And so we consider God's ways. We consider His nature. God is gracious and He offers salvation to the unworthy, to the undeserving. So He offers salvation to all. Because, after all, we are all equally condemned in our sin. There is no distinction. And so in the same way that sin equalizes us, Jesus equalizes us. And there is a sense in which the gospel, his, the nature of God reveals this distinction that we all are dead in our sins and in need of a Savior. And Christ is a Savior who is worthy and able to save to the uttermost anyone who would believe. The Jew and the Gentile. So they appeal to God's nature. The second thing that they appeal to is God's work. In verses 12 through 14, we see that they take into account what God has done. Paul and Barnabas argue for God's leading, yes, them to preach to the, the gospel to the Gentiles and, and Peter to preach the, the gospel, but also Paul and Barnabas point out that God is doing signs and wonders among the Gentiles. Why? Because his work is meant to bring them to himself. God desires that all be saved. And so he moves mightily among them in the, 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 for the sake of bringing authority and bringing a, a proof to the message that they are sharing, this message of the gospel. And so God very clearly is moving in love and grace toward the Gentiles in word and in deed. So they appeal to God's work. And then we see James step up. And James transitions to this next appeal because James points out that these men, what they're saying is true and that it is affirmed by the teachings of old. James points to the prophet Amos. And he makes our third appeal, the appeal to God's testimony. James quotes from Amos chapter 9, verses 11 and 12. And he sees the prophecy of Amos as a prophecy of God to faithfully save not just the chosen people, but as Amos would put it, all the nations. That God desires all the nations to be saved, what James calls and applies to Gentiles in verses 15 through 18. That all the nations who are called by his name. God has testified that he always has been about restoring 
those who seek him, who are called by his name, who are taking on the name of Christ. And so God has made these things his way. And he made these things his way long ago. In other words, yes, this looks and feels like a new thing that God is doing, but this has always been God's plan. That God always had a vision for his gospel, for the grace of God, for the salvation of God to extend beyond his people, but that his people would be his representatives to bring the truth of this gracious and loving and merciful and just God and that they would testify to this God to the world. Now God is doing that here. And so James appeals to God's testimony. And he makes this conclusion in verses 19 through 21. And I, 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 he's not done, in, in, and he shifts his, his appeal now to, to godly worship, to recognizing God. And, and how are we to go about recognizing God and putting him in his rightful place? James returns to this idea of turning to God. In his appeal to godly worship, he determines that anyone who has turned to God should not be distracted by the differences in the old ways, but instead they should be exhorted, they should be challenged, they should be strengthened by a resolve to keep the main things the main things. Firstly, that Christ has made a way to redemption by grace through faith, and that way, that way of Christ is a work of transformation. That, that the moment that a person, whether Jew or Gentile, surrenders themselves and gives their life to Christ, they are made a new creation. And it takes time for us to, to walk in the fullness of what that new creation is. But that new creation is, at the moment of surrender, a new creation. The old has passed away, the new has come. That's why baptism by immersion is a symbol of what God is doing. Because we... In our sins have been put to death and we are buried. And what, what exists now in Christ is a new life. And James commends that they walk by grace through faith and they understand the salvation. But secondly, he, he, he points to the unity among the churches. That there be unity in their corporate worship. That they not offend one another in their differences, but that, the, that, that worship together would bring them together. And so we see these four things that James brings attention to. It's somewhat of an odd list for us, but we must look through this list, look at this list through the eyes of, of ceremonial worship. Because it was when they gathered together and worshiped together that they were experiencing so much of a stark difference in the ways that they were living their lives. After all, the Jews were very ceremonially, culturally about their religious beliefs and practices. And so James commends these four things, that they, that they abstain from these things not to offend their Jewish brothers by worshiping in the ways that the pagans worshiped. That they worship instead as one, that they worship as the body of Christ. And so, so James calls them then to do these things, to reject idolatry, to reject pagan sexualized worship, to recognize the sanctity of blood as the representative for life, to have reverence for blood. And so again, being mindful of the offense to their Jewish brothers. And once these appeals have been made, then they shift their attention to a decision, to, to finding a consensus and I love what it says after Peter stood and spoke and, and testified to God's nature that the assembly fell silent. That we would be mindful of the fact that when we get out of our own way and we let God be God and, and we reveal who God is and we look to who God is and we remember who God is, that everything else falls away. And I imagine that what was happening in this debate Though it was a reasonable debate and one worth having, 
that some of their own pride and selfishness was creeping up in their conversation. And they began to look toward their own preference of how they practiced their faith. And in appealing to God, in turning to God, they recognized the thing that matters most. Who is God? What has He said? And what are we to do about it? And so look with me at verse 22 through 35 as they shift their focus to this this resolve, to this consensus that they made. It seemed good to the apostles and to the elders with the whole church. Notice the unity here. To choose men from among them and send them to Antioch with Paul and Barnabas. And they sent Judas, called Barsabbas, and Silas, leading men among the brothers with the following letter. The brothers, both the apostles and the elders, to the brothers who are of the Gentiles in Antioch and Syria and Sicilia, greetings. Since we have heard that some persons have gone out from us and troubled you with words unsettling your mind, although we gave them no instructions, It seemed good to us, having come to one accord, to choose men and to send them to you with our beloved Barnabas and Paul. Men who have risked their lives for the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. We therefore sent Judas and Silas, who themselves will tell you the same things by word of mouth. For it seemed good to the Holy Spirit and to us (coughs) Excuse me. To lay on you no greater burden than these requirements. That you abstain from what has been sacrificed to idols and from blood and from what has been strangled and from sexual immorality. If you keep yourselves from these, you will do well. Farewell. And so when they sent off, they went down to Antioch and having gathered the congregation together, they delivered the letter. And when they had read it, they rejoiced because of its encouragement. And Judas and Silas, who were themselves prophets, encouraged and strengthened the brothers with many words. And after they had spent some time, they were sent off in peace by the brothers to those who had sent them. And Paul and Barnabas remained in Antioch, teaching and preaching the word of the Lord with many others also. I want you to see here that as they turn from their appeal to God, they turn toward an appeal to godly leadership. And they uphold these men and they they commend the churches to trust the godly leadership. Not just of the men who were coming by word of mouth, but trusting the leadership of those who had gathered and who had talked and who had met together and debated this and had come to a conclusion, had come to a consensus. And so in dealing with spiritual disagreements, they turned to God and now they turned to leadership. So here are five things that we see about this godly leadership. In turning and trusting godly leadership, which is point number three, there are these, uh, if you're taking notes, some subpoints here. The godly leadership is number one, unifying. If you look at verse 25, it says they sought to be in one accord. They sought to unify what man was trying to divide. In number two, we see that godly leadership is clarifying. In verse 26, it says that they will tell you the same things by word of mouth that they had written in these letters. That that these men wanted them to know the truth and walk in it. And so it was a clarification. Godly leadership provides a clear path forward. The third thing we see this spiritual godly leadership doing is is we see an appeal to the fact that it is costly. Verse 26 says that these are men who committed to the cause in such a way that they risked their own lives for the sake of Christ. These were not leaders in word only, but they had put their very lives on the line. Number four, godly leadership is relieving. Verse 28 tells us that they followed the leading of the Holy Spirit, and in doing so they sought to lessen the burden of faith. And obedience to Christ. Not to be a burden, but to strengthen the new believers. And I love that when you, when, when you see that they read the letter, that that's what happened. They were encouraged and they were strengthened. And this is why I say verse uh, number five, 
Godly leadership is encouraging. Godly leadership points to what to do and what not to do, but in so doing, it encourages godly behavior, not legalism. And so we have taken a look at their commendation and understand that that there's truth to how they approached their spiritual disagreements and handling their spiritual disagreements. But look with me as we finish this chapter, as we see yet another occasion for differences among the believers. Very different difference, but a difference nonetheless. Verse 36 says that after some days... Paul said to Barnabas, let's return and visit the brothers in every city where we proclaimed the word of the Lord and see how they are. And Barnabas wanted to take with them John, called Mark. Paul thought it best not to take with them the one who had withdrawn from them in Pamphylia and had not gone with them to the work. But there arose a sharp disagreement so that they separated from each other. Barnabas took Mark with him and sailed away to Cyprus. And Paul chose Silas and departed, having been commended by the brothers to the grace of the Lord. They went through Syria and Cilicia, strengthening the churches. So this time there's a disagreement regarding not their theology, but their association. In other words, Paul wants to do a reunion tour. He wants to get the band back together. And he wants to make another pass through these places where they have Preach the gospel and sing God do a mighty work <clears throat> that God had <coughs> excuse me that God had birthed new believers in their first journey and they wanted to go and, and, and get the band back together as I said but but here's what I love right Barnabas is set on having John Mark come and play drums in the band and Paul says look John came with us the last time but he didn't stick with us and so let's not do that now here's the interesting thing about this disagreement we are not before, nor are we now, given any context as to why John Mark did not go with them. And Paul has taken issue with it, but it seems for us that the point is not whether or not Barnabas was right or Paul was right, or John was wrong, or John was right. But yet, this is what happened. And I think that's because our takeaway ought to be What we do as believers when we have differences. That there are times when we must appeal to God and and come to a, a consensus about a thing. But there are other times as believers when we can agree to disagree. We can agree to disagree on things that are not theology. But if we're talking about how we want to see God's will done among us, we can agree to disagree on how we accomplish that. And that's very clearly where Paul and Barnabas end up. Paul goes one way and he takes Silas. And Barnabas goes another way and he takes John Mark. And what do we see happening? We see more ministry being done. And we see God accomplishing the work that he sought out to accomplish in them. Which was what? Strengthening the churches. And so there are times when we will have spiritual disagreements and would we be wise to glean from acts 15 how we are to do that because certainly spiritual disagreements still exist among us today and i remember running running into some for the first time as a a college student that we would be prepared not to have the answers though often we do but when we don't that we would know the appropriate means of resolving these things and thinking through these issues. I want to close with something that I've been very prayerful about, and, and I don't want to approach this in any kind of <clears throat> flippant way. But I do see a correlation in, in this spiritual disagreement and how they approach this spiritual disagreement with where we find ourselves today as a church not just Crossroad Baptist Church but as believers there is ways in which we must there are differences that we must resolve prayerfully humbly lovingly 
turn to God and let God show us as we appeal to His nature and His word and His ways how we are to think about and live out our faith. Today is June the 2nd. Yesterday marked the beginning of what has become known as Pride Month. And we as believers and the church at large as we've seen with what's happening in the Methodist denomination have come to a place where we must answer the question and and, and mind this wording. Can one be openly, actively involved in same-sex relationships and be right with God? How are we to answer that question? And that in answering that question, we would all, each of us, put away our pride and turn to God and let God be God. How are we to be faithful in answering spiritual disagreements among us? See, this wasn't a question of how we were to share Jesus with the lost. This is a disagreement that had come up among the believers of how they were to conduct themselves as believers. And this is just one of the many ways that we as Christians still today must be diligent and faithful to resolve these things. So if you would grant me the grace to just go through these quickly. I think that we also can apply these same appeals in this situation. That we might in this question turn to God and appeal to God in regards to answering. So think about God's nature in regards to a brother or sister in Christ Celebrating Pride Month, celebrating the, the things that we see taught and, and carried along with these LGBTQ issues. What is God's nature? First and foremost, that He is creator. He's sovereign. He's king. And as I've said so many times, that we must, in seeing that nature of God, recognize that that means We are not. Therefore, His ways are best. And we must submit. We must submit our desires, our feelings, our emotions. Our own nature must submit to Him. Give Him the right to cut away anything that does not belong. And has nothing to do specifically with Pride Month. But each one of us, allowing God to cut away the things in our lives that do not belong as believers, as His, as ambassadors for Christ. The creation cannot tell the Creator how to conduct itself. And so we look to His nature for clarity on these issues. The second thing that we do is we look to the work of God. and We, as the early church, appeal to God's Work And we ought to be reminded of God's transforming power in the life of the believer. That we are a new creation, as I've already said, and we are not who we were. The old has passed away. Thank God it has. That we all humbly recognize that we, each one of us, apart from Christ, is dead in our sins. There is no righteousness in us apart from Christ. And that is true for us and for our brothers and sisters in Christ and for a lost and dying world. And it is not only true in regards to sexual sin, but all sin. We are, the Bible is clear, slaves to sin. Apart from the freedom that comes through Jesus and through His work on the cross. And so we ought to first recognize this in ourselves and walk humbly in that freedom, not lording it over others, but as an appeal, as freed men to slaves. 
Second thing that we do is we appeal to God's testimony. We start with a recognition that God rebukes pride, all pride. Pride among us, and he commends humility. That means pride in sin, and it means pride in righteousness. That he would have it all cut away. Proverbs teaches as such. Proverbs 11.2 tells us, When pride comes, then comes disgrace. But with the humble there is wisdom. May we be wise in humility. 1 John likewise teaches us not to love the world or the things in the world. But in chapter 2 verse 16 it says that all that is in the world, the desires of the flesh and the desires of the eyes and the pride of life is not from the Father, but it is from the world. And we cling to the Father. And we look to the Father. We turn to God. We make our appeal to God. Lastly, as they appeal to God in their worship, we appeal to God in worship of Him. We cannot submit our bodies, therefore, as instruments of unrighteousness and also make an appeal to His worship. Romans 16, Romans 6, 13 makes it clear that we are not to be about ourselves and unrighteousness. It tells us in Romans 6, 12, let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body to make you obey its passions, but do not present your members to sin as instruments for unrighteousness. But each one of us present yourselves to God as those who have been brought from death to life and your members to God as instruments for righteousness. For sin will have no dominion over you since you are not under law but under grace. That we would carry God's grace not as righteous and chosen and arrogant, but as those who have been called to be ministers of reconciliation, having been reconciled to God ourselves, pleading on behalf of God that others be reconciled to God. Even those who believe in the gospel but have not submitted themselves to it. And so, in closing, I was reminded as we think about appealing to God's worship of one of my favorite passages, Romans 12. Verses 1 and 2 tells us that we, God, Paul here appeals to the brothers by the mercies of God to what? To present our bodies as living sacrifices. Holy and acceptable to God. Why? This, Paul says, is our spiritual act of worship. Submission. Not conforming to the ways of the world, but being transformed by the renewing of our mind. And watch what happens when we do. Paul says, then you will know the good and acceptable and perfect will of God for your lives in Christ Jesus. Brothers, sisters, there are questions, disagreements that we must graciously, lovingly, Work through to the glory of God. But I submit to you that God doesn't need keyboard warriors. He needs ministers of reconciliation. He's called ministers of reconciliation. One of the things I found interesting about their appeal to this issue of circumcision among the Gentiles, as James pointed to the fact that in every city and in every synagogue, the, the law of Moses was still read and taught. I take that to mean this, that the truths of God and the will of God and the ways of God have not been taken away from in this work of God in the Gentiles, but that the word of God was still upheld among his people. Why? So that the Holy Spirit of God might convict and move and continue to change the hearts and minds of those who had submitted themselves to it. That we, brothers and sisters, would let the, 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 the people who are coming to Christ as infants, that we would let the Holy Spirit of God work 
on them. That we would be gracious and patient among them as the Holy Spirit convicts and as they respond. And so we have this calling among us today as they did then to to heed God's word and to use an appeal to who he is as a way of letting us resolve our spiritual differences. And I pray to God that we would not just take to heart the the results of these disagreements, but that we would take to heart the means of getting there. That we would be willing and able to humble ourselves and look to God and appeal to God. My prayer this morning in, in feeling that application fitting is that you would hear my heart in that. Brothers, sisters, we cannot be those who speak truth without love. Let us love. But let us hold to the truth. Empowered by it, humbled by it, that God would be glorified in it. Let's pray. So we do, Lord, submit to you today. And we ask that you would move mightily amongst us. Lord, that you not only teach us what to believe and and think about you and your ways, but how we approach the, the ways in which we approach this revelation of how we ought to overcome spiritual differences among us. And we pray, God, that you would help us. Help us to remove our own pride. Help us to be obedient to your word, to appeal to your nature. We submit ourselves to you. We are yours. We are your people. We want to fulfill, God, the calling to be ministers of reconciliation. But we also, Lord, we want to be a part of what it means to strengthen the church. Lord, to encourage brothers and sisters in Christ, not tear tear down our brothers and sisters in Christ. May we be unified in our beliefs because we've been unified in our submission before you so that you might speak and speak clearly. God, I pray for godly leadership amongst us. Thank you for our godly leaders continuing to keep us humble and worthy to be used by you to help us as your people to respond in this time as we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand and sing together. Worthy of every song we could ever sing Worthy of all the praise we could ever bring Oh
Jesus, the only one who could ever say, worthy of every breath we could ever breathe, we live for you. on his love and him being Christ, being high and lifted up, being sovereign, being king among us, that we would walk as his people in obedience to his word. Um, if you get the chance today, encourage the, the two graduates that got to be here today. Pray for all of our graduates. Uh, let me mention to you this Wednesday, we will kick off our summer uh, kids and youth programming, adult Bible study, um, and that will be at 630 from 630 to 730. Uh, and I think everybody's going to be meeting downstairs in this location area, upstairs, downstairs, over here. There won't be anybody in the CLC, um, but I uh, wanted to mention that to you. And uh, pray that you have a great week and a blessed week. Danielle, will you close us in prayer? Yeah, I think we just really just sang our prayer. That's honestly, true. Honestly, but I will. Father, we just thank you so much. And we, we do say you are worthy. You're worthy of everything that we do. You're worthy of all of our praise. And you, Jesus, are the name above every name the only one who can save, Father. Father, help us to have your heart this week as we go about our business, Lord, but may we be about your business, Lord, this week. May we be your hands and feet. Give our, our trust only to you, Father, in you alone. We just want to love you and praise you today. Thank you for the worship on the mountain this morning. Thank you for the word that we were able to sit and hear and receive, Lord. Now, may that we go and do your will using that word. In Jesus' name, amen.